Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you might be from. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition, another episode of Friday at the Funhouse with Martin Popoff. Good morning, Martin. How are you? Yes, morning, sir. Doing okay. L- looking forward to this. I got stuff all over the place because obviously these hired guns have been on a lot of things. So Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, I got stuff all over the place, too. I got rid of a lot of stuff, though, this morning, as you can see. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It was yeah. a bit of a shock. I know, I know. Uh, you know, like I said, go go big or go home. So uh, I just, I was in the mood for a change. I've had the long locks for a while now. And I just, uh, I don't know. You know, as you get older, sometimes you get, uh, I, I like the fact that I can still grow the hair really long, but I certain aspects of it, I was starting to get a little dissatisfied with. And I said, you know what? Let's just get rid of it and see what happens. And I, I walked out of the, my uh, hairdresser shop this morning and I was like, ah, this is okay. I can, I can deal with this. Yeah. So. It's funny, people accuse us as being too old for wearing rock shirts too all the time. Right? I know, right? So now yeah. right now here, I look like everybody else now, but I'm still going to wear the rock shirts. So yeah. 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 And next thing, the, the new glasses are in order next week. I'm going oh. to the eye doctor next week. I'm, I, I'm in need of new glasses. So I want to get something darker and bigger frames, kind of like what you have, but you know, uh, because this is just, I don't know, I don't like these anymore. Plus my eyes have changed a little bit since I last got them, but, uh, but whatever. Hey, we had tons of rain here yesterday because we got to get the weather report in. So we had storm upon storm upon storm yesterday yeah. tons of water tons of thunder and lightning this morning the sun is out it's like 58 degrees out and uh, fall is here officially i think yeah us too it's freezing up here we've had a lot of rain and uh, i think I'll, I'll definitely try get out for a jog today and uh and probably on that jog play some voivod again which uh which is a band i'm going to talk about here as a- nothing wrong with that man we, lo- we like voivod so cool <laughs> All righty. So uh, this is now that we got all that out of the way, this is part two of our look at uh, favorite hired guns. As we did last week's episode, we each took a specific kind of like instrument or whatever and uh, named some some folks who play that instrument who have been appearing everywhere. So today, Martin's going to talk about some bass players. I'm going to talk about some singers and I'll have Martin kick us off with his first choice of the day. All right. So my first choice is uh, Rudy Sarzo. Uh, Love Rudy to death. He's a great guy. You know, you always think in the industry, somebody someday is going to tell you what a horrible person this guy is. Right. You know, and with some of these guys. Right. And with Rudy, it's just every time you meet him, he's just the the super nicest guy. And and I never hear like I've I've interviewed many, many, many people who have played with Rudy and nobody's ever had a bad word about him. So I guess he is a great guy. Right. Um, You know, but you're always skeptical about those things. Right. Yeah. But uh, but no, Rudy, great guy. Um, been in a lot of situations. Um, his his first album, he was on Quiet Riot too, so one of those Japanese albums um, that is is quite poppy and not all that great, right? He's not on the first Quiet Riot, but uh, but it's interesting. I guess I guess we first really get to hear uh, from him on this record, uh, this Aussie record, and and what's uh, so this is the live album of the Sabbath songs done really well. It's a really awesomely put together live album it's quite underrated how how good those versions are on that with tommy aldridge and brad gillis and all that but the interesting thing about rudy is that he goes back to quiet riot for for metal health there's your there's your fully signed metal health and uh what a great move that was for him um you know so he leaves a great situation for something that's risky turns out six million seller this is this is like a massive massive uh, album so six million certified in the states he's still there for condition condition critical which actually goes platinum so he's doing great uh unfortunately i was just checking this morning he doesn't really feature in the songwriting uh he's only on one song on condition critical and not, not on the first one but uh but you know after that he definitely becomes one of these one of these great versions of a hired gun he's even in blue oyster cult for a short time which doesn't even make a lot of sense but he's yeah. he's with mars project driver you know white snake is is your perfect hired gun situation he's there for slip of, slip of the tongue um but you know ripper owens play the game i mean they play my game there's a there's a perfect this is ripper with a ton of guest stars and rudy is just one of those guys who's always a guest star he's always on those tribute albums right where you're phoning in your files and or you know sending over your files dio you know i always thought he was in dio for a lot more stuff but he's he's basically kind of a live guy in some of these bands so he's on he's on live holy diver um what else the animetal i remember interview he's done these weird japanese situations um michael angelo batillo manic eden um 
you know, and and two more things that make you the ultimate hired gun. Uh, you know, he winds up in, in Queens, right, featuring uh, Jeff Tate with frequency. Right, you know, yeah. There's a great hired gun situation. Yep. And uh, and he's, you know, and then in Guess Who. So he's in, in a version of the Guess Who, which makes no sense whatsoever. But talk about your perfect hired gun. Thing. It's a paycheck. Hey, it's what it's all about, yeah. right? <laughs> So a consummate pro, he looks good. He's a nice guy. He fits into these situations. He's the guy you call uh, who can get the job done sort of thing. Um, but uh, but I, I like that early narrative where he goes back to Quiet Riot and uh, and is part of this huge band. So he's he's basically on a victory lap, <laughs> you know, since, you know, if, if you're on a if you're on a six six times platinum seller with your own band. And then and then a, and then a platinum album. Everything after that's kind of gravy. But uh, but he never sees the huge huge fame ever again, other than arguably slip of the tongue, I suppose. Yeah, true. I mean, I'm sure he's been well paid throughout his career, and and he he let's be honest, he's a perfect example of this entire program we're doing here. I mean, he's just appeared everywhere, and you know, everybody always mentions, like you said, what a nice guy he is, but a pretty damn solid bass player too. He's like one yeah. of those guys. He's not like a Billy Sheehan, look at me type of guy, but he's in the pocket yeah. all the time, rock solid. And I think that's why everybody wants to work with him. I mean, he can fit into almost any slot. Looks good, right? Consummate professional. Great stage presence too, throwing yeah. the shapes, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Like he's, yep. he's really good at good at that. So uh, yeah, perfect, perfect package. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good choice. All right, my first choice today is a guy who... Uh, hasn't been around in the spotlight all that long, but he is becoming like one of those hired gun guys. And again, I'm doing vocalists here, this everybody knows. Uh, he's becoming one of those guys in like, uh, let's say the last five years or so. Uh, I'm talking about Ronnie Romero, of course, uh, Chilean vocalist who yeah. just popping up all over the place now. Guy's got a great voice. He kind of sounds like a cross between, you know, Ronnie James Dio and maybe a little David Coverdale at times, although a little more on the metal side, uh, you know, as far as Coverdale goes, but good stage presence. You know, he's a small little guy. He's got the, he's got the, uh, the Latino, the Spanish accent, right? He's got the short hair, but he just kind of looks the part. He looks like a badass. And, you know, we first started hearing about Ronnie Romero with his band Lords of Black pretty good kind of like traditional metal power metal type of band and they have a whole bunch of albums out but then you know all of a sudden uh, Richie Blackmore comes calling and he is in a, a, whether there's still a thing or not I don't know but this latest iteration of Richie Blackmore's Rainbow so there is Ronnie up there singing Rainbow Classics Deep Purple Classics doing it pri quite well my opinion I think Ronnie's one of the shining stars of this whole new thing of iteration of Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, which I'm not that big on overall, but I think he does a pretty good job of singing, you know, all those songs. Would love to hear him do like an album of all originals with Richie. I don't know if that's that's going to happen, but he's also becoming like the uh, Frontiers Records kind of like singer for hire. So he shows up, he's on The Ferryman. I have that CD. I just couldn't track it down. He's on Sunstorm. Uh, he appears on the Intelligent Music Project thing, which is again, another one of those kind of conglomerate projects that comes out every year or whatever, where they bring in all these singers and musicians and things. Uh, he also is, I guess, the, the lead singer for Vandenberg now, whether it's just for the album or whether that's going to continue, I don't know. I like this album a lot. I think he's a, he's a really good match with Adrian. I think that's really cool. Uh, he also appears on the latest uh, Michael Schenker group project, Immortal, along with a bunch of other singers. Word is it that Schenker really wants to work with him, perhaps exclusively going forward? I don't know, because uh, Ronnie's involved in a million things. And I'm sure by the time this, this video airs, there will be another three projects uh, that, that are announced that uh, Ronnie is, is a part of. But a really good vocalist. Uh, like I said, he's got all the tools. I think some people struggle with his accent at times because you can obviously you can hear that English is not his his first uh, language. But I think he's got he's got the vocal presence. He's certainly has the 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 kind of it factor. So we'll kind of see. So he's kind of for me like a work in progress. Is Ronnie Romero going to continue to pop up everywhere and everywhere in the years, months, and years to come, or will he latch on with someone or a band and that be his thing going forward? I don't know. That remains to be seen. But uh, for right now now he he totally is a higher gun and uh more to come on that i guess so back to martin 
Yeah, and and I hope he does another Vandenberg so you get that consistency because that was a great yeah. album. And I and I hope he you know becomes an exclusive guy with Michael Schenker. Although Michael's got a, got a lot of other guys with some great pedigree who I'd like to yeah. see more often uh, with Michael. It'd be great to see a full full Graham Bonnet album now. You know that Graham's not an Alcatraz. That would that would be pretty incredible. Yeah, so, I yeah absolutely yeah yeah yeah. All right. Uh, so my next choice is uh, Jason Newstead. Um, I, I really like this guy's sort of career situation that he's gone through. Is he a hired gun? He's more like he's more like, uh, you know, a superstar who who is interested in certain things, certainly doesn't need the money. And uh, and he he ends up in some cool situations. So obviously he starts first with Flotsam and Jetsam, but then he's on to uh, Metallica. Uh, you know, this is the this is the big posting. Um you know, real cool kind of like Dennis the Menace face and punk rock and hardcore kind of look to him, uh, you know, with the curly, curly hair. And he was a real headbanger. He got into some trouble with that. Right. Yep. Um, by being too much of a headbanger, um, you know, some some neck issues. Um, but uh, but yeah, he was he was a great choice for Metallica. He just had that sort of mischievous look to him. And, and he had the he had the credibility of being an underground bass guy but a metal head at the same time yeah. uh, with Flotsam and all that. But, you know, after the, the sort of semi acrimonious split with Metallica, that's a whole drama there, but you've got load and reload and, uh, and the black album, huge album. And, you know, rumored to have been paid very handsomely to be part of Metallica, but more like, here's a big paycheck. You know, I've heard things like $8 million per album and stuff like that. Right. Um, so you know, he, he, he eventually is moved on, but he's done some great things. And what, what I love about, well, I'll get to that in a sec, but certain things that, that weren't a big deal that he did that, that I thought were kind of stupid. He was part of rock star supernova with Gilby Clark and Tommy Lee and that, that singer guy, uh, well, you know, I don't know, was he American Idol or something? I can't remember. Uh, sorry, I forget his name, but, uh, but anyways, he was part of this thing and there was some hype behind it. And I remember going to see this at, uh, at Massey Hall. Um, but a couple things uh, so interesting, he goes on and, you know, he has a has a full on alternative project. So we realize there's other sides to Jason. Um, and then one of the pretty cool things that makes him a, an interesting dynamic in this hired gun thing is that he he started this uh, whole Chop House Records thing. And I remember for a while there, you would interview him and he'd be doing these various EPs with uh, with different people, and it was always really interesting. He'd have these guys buy to the chop house, and they'd jam, and they'd they'd knock out some songs and stuff. So I thought that was really cool. Like this one, uh, irate versus uh, sex satirica. Uh, irate had in it, for example, three songs: Jason Newstead, Devin Townsend, and Tom Hunting. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then uh, sex satirica had Tom Hunting, Andreas Kisser, and. Um, Jason Newstead for three songs. So that was really cool when he was doing these things. But I think the coolest thing about Jason uh, is that a he's he's a big time visual artist. He he just dove right into visual arts and painting, and he's done shows and stuff. And so that's really cool that he had this other side of him. But I think the very coolest thing uh, Jason ever did, and he he would probably believe this to this day because he's such a cool musicologist and he knows good taste when he when he sees it is he was part of Voivod. So he joined up with these guys for Voivod, Voivod, Infini, and Kators. And in the middle of this also, sadly, we're, we're losing, you know, um, Piggy as a guitarist to cancer. But, but essentially, you know, Jason's on these amazing, amazing Voivod albums where they, where they kind of simplify their sound. They get a little more straightforward perfect, perfect production, just quite uh, weirdly accessible uh, in terms of Voivod albums, but that makes them accessible. Um, that makes them, you know, completely easy drinking Voivod, you know, this is the yeah. kind of stuff you can go jogging to kind of thing. Uh, actually, and, and, you know, the early stuff is quite, quite extreme, but um, no, he, he, I, I love that he, you know, recognized and realized this is probably the coolest band he'll ever be in. Uh, you know, this is this is a cooler band to be in than Metallica. Uh, and uh, I swear, you know, he's he's smart enough and grounded enough and uh, and and, uh, you know, wise enough as a music guy to know if he never makes another album for the rest of his life. The coolest thing he's ever been okay. on are those three Voivod albums. He knows that. 
right? Yeah. Uh, which is kind of cool. And just the final thing to say about him as a as a hired gun that that really like drives home the point of being a hired gun. Part of when he was on tour with Voivod, he double dutied as bassist for Ozzy Osbourne. He, he you know, big huge influential guy. So so he gave Voivod one of their career highlights backing up Ozzy. They backed up Rush as well, which is a career highlight. But I remember when they came to Toronto here, you know, Maple Leaf Gardens, or was it Air Canada Centre at that point? I think it's Air Canada Centre. Um, but there he is, playing bass with Voivod, and then he comes back on stage and plays bass with Ozzy. So yeah. talk about talk about hired gunness, right? Yeah. So yeah, really cool guy with a cool career path. Keeps quiet. He's you don't hear a lot from him. He's a, he's a little bit uh, in the background. Um, and just, uh, and I just think it's really cool that he's done Voivod and he's a visual artist. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I met and interviewed him in New York city when he was still with Voivod. Um, really nice guy. Yeah. He's very mellow. And he basically told me as well that Voivod was kind of like the coolest gig he ever had, which yeah. why, how could it not be? Right. Yeah. How could it not be? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool, good choice. Um, all right, my next selection for a vocalist, uh, a Scottish singer who we first started to hear about. It. Again, we're talking about Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Uh, Doogie White showing up in A Stranger in a Soul. There he is right there. Okay, this is really the first we would hear about Doogie. Um, really good singer, different singer. He's got his own style and his own sound i think that's one of the things i've always liked about Duke. you know is he the best singer on the planet probably not i'm sure he knows that but he's got he's got the doogie white thing going on really well and obviously richie blackmore liked that so uh did this one album with richie that was it because again uh richie i think was more interested in doing other things which we saw him do uh shortly thereafter with blackmore's night but he had one last rainbow album in him at the time uh doogie would then once richie put that to bed doogie would start showing up all over the place uh Yngwie malmstein spent some time with Yngwie on the unleashed the fury album i think he did he, i think he might have done one other album with him uh he was in la paz Okay, he was in Tank for a bit. He might still be in Tank. I'm not even sure. Uh, Cornerstone. He spent a little time in Praying Mantis, right? He uh, is in this very cool band, or was, uh, with this very cool band, Demon's Eye, which was basically a Deep Purple tribute band who decided to then go and do an album of all new originals uh, with Doogie on vocals. And this album is quite, quite good. Uh, and then, of course, he, he started working with uh, Michael Schenker. So he's on the... Uh, the various different Michael Schenker albums of in recent uh, Temple of Rock and Michael Schenker Fest. And now he is the lead singer of Alcatraz because of course we've had Alcatraz who have gone their separate ways with Graham Bonnet. So that now I guess there's going to be Graham Bonnet to Alcatraz and then Alcatraz with the rest of the guys in Doogie Front and that. So, uh, so the career of Doogie White as a hired gun is continuing. Uh, honestly, for a guy like this, I don't see that deviating from that at all. I think that's that's what he does. That's what he'll continue to do. I'm sure we'll see him working with working with uh, Shanker again and, uh, you know, whatever. But that's that's just Doogie White in a nutshell. He's like, wherever you need me, I'm ready. Just pull out the checkbook and I'll be there. That's kind of what he does. So, uh, but a good singer. I, I think a good working man singer. He's He'll never, you know, you'll never confuse him with a Ronnie D or someone like that. But I think he's a good, solid singer that people know what they're going to get from him and he can kind of slide in anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. His, he's got an interesting, unique voice that has a little bit of a twang to it. A little bit. Yeah. It's rough at the same time. And it's almost like, you know, when, when you said that you were describing him, I'm, I'm thinking like he's, he's even got like a 10% of a Gary Barden to him too. He's got a little bit of a Gary Barden in the voice and in the look. He kind of looks a little like Gary, right? Yeah, a little, a little chunkier Gary, right? A little shorter because I think Gary's <laughs> a little taller. But yeah, no, that, that's a good comparison. Yeah, and honestly, I think he's a better singer than Gary. But yeah, yeah, me. yeah, yeah. He's definitely <laughs> doing doing uh, better out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So my next choice is uh, John Wetton. Um, you know, love John Wetton to death. Interviewed him many times. Met him many times. He was such a soft spoken, super nice, polite guy. Sadly, we lost him to cancer. Right? I think I'm pretty sure it's cancer. Um, <laughs> But he was on a lot of things early on. Uh, Mogul Thrash, what do you know? Got a little bit of a list here. Fa family: Gordon Haskell, Larry Norman. Um, uh, but uh, but his his first big things were uh, you know as as part of King Crimson, 
right? He did a bunch of this stuff. Um, but what we know him for the most, I would say, is uh, is UK to begin with, uh, you know, kind of the first big super group. So we've got your, your debut there. And we've got this. Uh, in the interim, uh, Roxy Music, he shows up on a live album. He's on a little bit of your eye heap. Yep. Right. Uh, in the middle there. And what we like about him as a hired gun. Here's a kind of a neat thing. I've got the Peter Simpson. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sinfield vinyl. Uh, you know, he's just one of many guys on this. But what I like about this is that it, it's got the um, the mat, this thing, um, you know, yeah. and, and it's actually got an inset glossy thing glued onto it. Yeah, same same with it on the back. Right. Kind of different. Um, but uh, but a neat thing about him is that he brings um, he brings a bass style that has a little bit of Chris Squire to it, like a little bit of distortion on it. So but he, he does have a personality and a lot of the guys, you know, I'm talking about, you, you know, it's, it's hard to really pull out their personality in it. But he also brings singing. So he, he brings this great voice, um, this this kind of sonorous. I don't know if you'd call it a baritone, but you always know it's him. Uh, Pushes a lot of air, a little bit like a Graham Bonnet. I always compare them because they, they're the kind of vocalists where you're you're a little bit on the edge of your seat, whether he's going to hit the note because he has to use so much power to get there, but they do get there. So, so it's a real energetic quality. And then, of course, later on, this is one of his big claims to fame. He's part of Asia. Uh, has this massive debut album and the next one and uh, and basically um, you know that that's his big band but uh, but I, I love that he's part of King Crimson and UK and Asia uh, you know later on Ash too for a spell Wishbone Ash okay yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, you know lots of Asia live albums lots of uh, icon wet and down stuff yep. um, more amazing amazing he's he's on a lot of things like one or two songs here or there but he was also a pretty big solo artist and you know one of my fond memories is I, I believe he was the first or second in-person interview I ever did back in 94 for this oh, wow. right here in Toronto um, you know so I was, I was a little nervous in that but uh but he you know put me right at ease it was we had a fine interview but had to go down to the record company office to to talk to him for this solo album and then yeah met him and did phoners with him a lot over the years and the last time was in person when UK reformed and and played here in Toronto it was it was him and Eddie and uh, Terry Bozio uh, it was amazing. It was really one of one of the one of the craziest best gigs. Uh, I've got notes here: Phil Manzanera, so Diamond Head, K Scope, Wet Manzanera. So yeah, what a what a what an absolutely esteemed catalog of prog this guy has been on. He's been on in so many uh, really highfalutin intellectual prog sort of situations, and yet he's just you know he's he's that journeyman hired gun guy, and he, no airs about him. But uh, but talk about being a lot on a lot of uh, Menza rock, you know, yeah. like pretty, pretty amazing thing. So there you go. John Wetton. Yeah. And uh, and technically he could appear in either of our lists or either of our lists as the vocalist or bass player. And in fact, one of the guys that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, very similar situation. So we'll get to that. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love Wetton. Uh, very, very underrated bass player. And I think, you know, most people always think of him as the vocalist uh, and a great vocalist he always was. But you're, you're absolutely right. Always a lot of fuzz, very aggressive bass style, which I always like. Big, big, beefy sound. Um, yeah, God, miss him. Such such a great talent. All right. My next uh, guy uh, had a had a career in pop music before he was kind of called upon to replace uh a guy named Ronnie James Dio in Rainbow, of course, talking about Graham Bonnet here. Uh, Down to Earth was his big, you know, big first moment in the sun. All right. Uh, the only album he would appear on uh, with Richie Blackmore before Richie moved on to Jolyn Turner. That got him really noticed. Uh, and then not too long afterwards, he would appear uh, with Michael Schenker on the Assault Attack album, arguably Michael Schenker's greatest MSG album. I will forever proclaim that. Um, but of course, this lineup would not last too long. There was that famous uh, gig, right, out in, in, in the UK, where a uh, big festival gig, where, of course, Graham had a little too much to drink and 
said some things he shouldn't have and then pulled out as you know what and boom he's out of he's out of shanker's band so so much for that right but that would not deter mr graham bonnet of course then he would form his own band called alcatraz which he would do uh, for a couple of albums before that kind of you know came and went uh, he was then hired by Chris and Pelletieri for the Impelletieri album, which is very, very good. Uh, he would also show up in this uh, Blackthorn project, which probably the heaviest album he's ever done with Graham, just like full on, you know, metal voice. I mean, you know, Graham is a really good hard rock singer. He has a good melodic voice, got a very powerful voice, especially early on. But man, here he's just like trying to like, you know, break glass without a doubt. I mean, this is like aggressive, crazy stuff. Uh, he would also show up in uh, Anthem and a million other appearances. He would play with Dario Molo and, uh, and you know, Graham Bonnet was just showing up everywhere and anywhere. Uh, and in recent years, he has put the, the, the Graham Bonnet band together, Alcatraz once again. Now he's out of Alcatraz. Now Graham Bonnet's Alcatraz, like I talked about before. But he has like reconnected with Michael Shanker. So he has been doing some double duty with Michael Shanker Fest in recent uh, years. And uh, he's on this album. In fact, uh, you can see him. There he is on the back. With the sunglasses. The only guy wearing the sunglasses, right? Uh, so yeah. So he's another quintessential guy, especially during the uh, the eighties and the nineties, where just would show up everywhere and anywhere. But I think he has gained a reputation in the industry as uh, again like a go to guy with a very very unique voice. Uh, that he and he still got a lot of the vocal chops uh, at uh, what is he seventy years old, seventy two, something like that. I know Graham's getting up there, but uh, yeah, that's my next selection there. Yeah, I always say, I mean, people get tired of me saying this, I'm sure, but I, I always compare him to uh, Ronnie James Dio in that, in that, at least for me, I think he's, he's one of the only two guys that are on three of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time by three different bands. Yeah. And so that for me would be down to earth, uh, no parole for rock and roll and assault attack. Well, attack yeah, you know, three <clears> yeah those, are all, those are all classics, uh, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, I, I think he's excellent on that Impelitary album. I think that's, that's right below those. Hmm. And, you know, you could argue uh, Disturbing the Priest by Alcatraz is another really good one as well. And I, I mean, I like some of the other stuff that he's done, uh, you know, over the years. And I, I think this is a pretty damn good album too, The Blackthorn. So, uh, you know, although at the time, you know, did, did anybody hear of this? I mean, this kind of was like a pretty unknown album for a while that kind of sank without a trace and has been reissued in recent years. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, just a great singer and, uh, you know, one of the elder statesmen of heavy rock who's still out there kicking butt. Yeah, I mean, just pours me out so much that he's not in Alcatraz anymore. I wish they would have had a second album with that. And, you know, it, it pours me out also that those two Graham Bonnet band albums are not Alcatraz albums. They're not just called Alcatraz albums. Right. I wish they were part yeah. of it because they're so good. I mean, they're really they're, good. I like them yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's, I mean, this, this whole Alcatraz situation is just absolutely ridiculous because I honestly, uh, is anybody going to take the Alcatraz seriously without him singing? I, it just yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I know you got a couple of the other guys, but uh, it's, you know, sorry, Doogie and company, but uh, Alcatraz is wherever Graham is. That's just my opinion on that. Yeah. I mean, I'll, listen, I'll listen to their upcoming album and I'll give it a chance. Yeah. But to me, that's, you got to have him. That's, I mean, yeah. he formed that band. So that, that would be like doing the Dio band without Ronnie, right? I mean, you just, you can't, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's too bad. I mean, I I I like those guys. I kind of know those guys. And Giles is a, is a, their manager, is a buddy of mine. And uh, and I went and played that album. It's like it's just another power metal album out there. It really makes it's just it, it. Graham is so much a part of that band, right? Yeah. Um, and I think I think it was a lot to do with there was just too much guitar soloing on that Alcatraz after the and and Graham was shocked and fell out of the whole situation. It was just artistically he did not want to hear that. Yeah, um, but I think yeah, I think so he had enough of that uh, after the first uh, album, no, no parole, right? He's like, yeah. I don't want to do the Ingbe thing all over again. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's a that's a whole nother story. All right. Yeah. So my my next choice is uh, Jimmy Bain. Good old Jimmy Bain. Sadly, we lost him. Uh, he he died, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is right. I, I didn't go check again, but he he actually died on one of those rock cruises. Right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Florida. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um. So um. Gee, I'm, I'm, I'm missing where the heck is, uh, okay. Well, um, I don't have out, uh, oh yeah, there it is. Okay. So 
obviously rainbow risings may be the biggest thing he's uh, he's known for um this is this is obviously really cool and there's one of the great rock shots of a bass player oh, ever yeah that is Jimmy awesome down there in the in the smoke looking all dramatic and uh you know sadly uh three uh, three out of uh three out of five of these guys are no longer with us right um but anyways, he, he was he was part of that whole situation, uh, not for very long. And then we all wish these albums were better than they are, but they're just not that good. So he was part of this super group with Brian Robertson. And Jimmy's actually the lead singer, doesn't do that great a job. The songs aren't great. The production, Kit Wolven, supposed to be good. It's not very good. Um, they were just so, they were they just partied so hard, right? They were yeah, drug and freak yeah. and wild men, right? That's the yep. problem with Jimmy, right? And and it, it, it plagued him all through his career, unfortunately. A lot of heroin problems. Um, but um, I love the fact that he's on these records, the 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 two the two Phil uh, line at solo albums. Um, you know, he was a buddy of Phil's. He was a notorious drugging and drinking buddy with Phil, right? Um, but, you know, I remember talking to Jimmy and uh, he was one of the first, last guys Phil talked to. And he was, I think, um, uh, I think he's like the godfather to Phil's daughter or something as well. Um, so, so they were definitely buddies. Uh, he was on these, you know, and I remember talking to Jimmy about being on Kate Bush, the dreaming, you know, talk about a, a Menza, a Menza rock, high intellectual falutin, highfalutin album. He was part of that. Um, but obviously his biggest band, um, you know, in terms of a sustained situation is he's part of the classic Dio lineup and even beyond when they get Craig Goldie. I rated this my finest. Uh, we did a Contrarians episode and I rated this my favorite um, Dio album. And I took a really good look comparing it to Last in Line and Holy Diver. I love this album. Uh, this is a super heavy, well put together Dio album. But uh, so Jimmy's part of this and he's part of uh, part of, you know, the, the earlier classic stuff. And I wanted to pick him to laud him also for the fact that he's he's one of those guys that's considered a little bit of a secret weapon in terms of being a good songwriter and able yeah. to write hits. Um, so that's a really cool thing about Jimmy. Um, and he's been on some other things. Here's an here's a neat obscure little thing. This World War Three with Mandy Lyon and uh, and Vinny. Um, you know, he's he's the sidekick of Vinny on a lot of things. But um, what else? Gary Moore. Um, you know, later on, Three Legged Dog. He was he was even in the first incarnation of Last in Line. But then sadly, we lose him. Right, Heavy Crown. Um, so that's that's the cool thing about Jimmy. And he was always a super nice guy. Um, he just he just had, you know, his demons all all his life sort of thing. He was just too much. It's not even demons. I mean, he had he had his substance abuse problems, but he didn't seem like he was he had, you know, he he was just his personality was fine. Right. Um, so he didn't have demons in that that respect. He just seemed like uh, he, he seemed like he could get along in all these situations if it wasn't for the drug and then the drinking kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but like I say, um, super valuable guy to Ronnie because uh, because he really helped in the songwriting department. Yeah. And that's that's key. Yeah, you don't see too many bass players that kind of uh, fill that role for some of these big bands like that. Yeah. Great choice. All right. Uh, I kind of mentioned him briefly before, but uh, let's take a look at Joe Lynn Turner. Mm. So, of course, Joe, kind of an unknown vocalist. Uh, he was in this band called Fandango. Uh, of course, there were a couple, couple of Fandangos out there, but uh, this was the Joe Lynn Turner, kind of very poppy, kind of foreigner light type of band, a little R&B influence there. There's, there's the young Joe right in the middle. Uh, of course, Richie Blackmore is needing a new vocalist after Graham Bonnet's gone. Richie's going to want to go in more commercial directions. So uh, Joe winds up debuting with Richie and the Rainbow Guys on the Difficult to Cure album, right? They put out Straight Between the Eyes and, you know, they see some success there. Joe all of a sudden now is becoming kind of a household name. Uh, once Richie goes back to Deep Purple, Joe kind of sits around for a little bit. But then uh, who comes calling? but a guy who is very good at picking up hired guns, Mr. Ingve Malmsteen. So here you got uh, the Odyssey album, which for my money might be the best album that Joe has ever appeared on. And I remember specifically back in the day, I was a big Ingve fan, big Joe fan. I thought that their, their kind of marriage here was great because again, just like the song, like what you just talking about, Jimmy Bain, Joe was helping Ingve write songs. And this whole album is full of great songs and great hooks and great melodies, great guitar playing. It's kind of parts are heavy, parts are just good, classic commercial hard rock. Uh, 
unfortunately, you know, you got two guys with two pretty big egos and this only lasted the one album and the live album. And then Joe is off doing other things, right? And Ingve is off with his uh, vocalist of the year kind of marathon, which he has continued to this day, although now he's doing most of the singing himself. Uh, shortly thereafter, it's amazing how quickly all this stuff is happening. Uh, Deep Purple part ways with Ian Gillen. Of course, we know Blackmore and Gillen do not get along. So uh, Richie decides to convince the rest of the band that uh, maybe why don't we just bring Joe in because Roger and I are used to working with him. It'll be great. So we've got this album, okay. Slaves and Masters, which lasts for uh, a tour and into recording a follow-up album before the record label decides it's a better idea to bring in, uh, bring back Gillen, right? We got the anniversary of the band coming up. So uh, Joe is once again, gone from one of these major bands. Do we see a trend here? Sort of. Uh, and in between another, you know, there was this super group Mother's Army, which of course was, God, Martin, remind me who else was in that band. You had what's his face from, uh, from oh, Night man. Ranger. Um, mm -hmm. Who was on drums for that? I don't, God, I don't even remember. I remember. And then there's so much like the Joe solo albums and like the Hughes, the Hughes Turner album. They're, they're all, they're all just a big block of kind of the kind of music you expect from Joe, right? Right. Tons, and then, of, tons of music. Yeah, a lot of music. So there's a couple of Mother's Army albums. He shows up on a bunch of Brazen Abbott albums uh, in more recent times. Again, the whole Frontiers thing. He's popping up all over the place. He's doing these Sunstorm albums, all sorts of other stuff. And then lo and behold, he also shows up uh, with Michael Shanker on the Immortal album, right, which has a bunch of vocalists on it. We mentioned this one before. So, you know, again, Joe is just kind of doing his thing wherever he's needed. He fills in. Uh, he's one of those guys, a lot of these guys, I would like to see them kind of settle into something and do it over an extended period of time. But maybe that's just not ever going to be what these guys are all about. I don't know. But uh, Joe, again, has proven to be a pretty reliable singer. Really nice guy. Uh, he's got that kind of classic rock voice, right? Um, and he's got the look. So, but yeah, he has been a hired gun pretty much almost from the get-go. As soon as Richie Blackmore called that first time, that kind of set the rest of his career in motion. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny. He just he just strikes me as a as a guy who just just packs his lunch and goes to work every day. And it's odd that it's a vocalist doing this because the vocalist is so important in all these yeah. situations. He's the face of the band. He's the singer. He's usually the lyricist. And uh, so it's odd seeing a guy like that just here, there and everywhere sort of thing. But it, yeah. it just it's almost like it, it got into his brain at some point. Like, look, I'm just I'm, I'm, a, I'm a project guy. I'll just do this, this, this and this or whatever. Yeah. There was that one solo album, the, the first big corporate solo album. It's called Rescue You, right? Yeah. Um, that remember, big, you know, his face on the cover that that's when it was almost like he could have been a Rex Smith or a, you know, a, a pinup star kind of thing. Cause remember when Robin Zander did the solo album, Tommy Shaw did one, yep. you know, there's, there's these guys where it could have gone the other way, but it didn't, you know, that, that, yeah. that uh, failed too. But um, yeah. And then all the solo albums later on and stuff, man. Okay. Um, my last choice is Bob Daisley. Um, Bob is, a, is an interesting case because he came from Australia. He was in, he was on a fairly classic album, Cavus Jute. Uh, back then, it's known to be a little bit of a pioneering psych heavy album. Um, but, uh, you know, later on, we see him in uh, Widowmaker. He's part of this uh, semi super group. What do you think of that album? I'm not a big fan of these. I did a whole episode of, um, of my podcast, History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff, on these, on these super group bands that didn't quite work, work too well. And, and I always put these guys together with Detective. Um, they, they always reminded me a little bit of that. Um, so I, I just find these a little kind of all over the place, a little bit like Fandango is like that, although they're not a super group, but that, that Fandango band, like confused direction, I suppose, yeah. is the way I, I, I would put it. Um, uh, but you know, the, the neat thing you get with Bob and it's already starting with this cool band shot of them there, um, the neat thing you get with Bob is that he's a music writer and a lyric writer too. So he's one of these bass players that that's right in there. And then of course, notoriously, he's, he's part of Ozzy Osbourne uh, for those first couple of albums. And then he's out and then he's back. Uh, when Rudy, when Rudy goes back to Quiet Riot, you know, Bob is, is called back tail between the legs, you know, all is forgiven, come back. 
And, um, and, you know, I think his big claim to fame is that, you know, he was a very thoughtful, good lyricist for Ozzy early on. And, and he made Ozzy's career in terms of, of being that guy who came up with these great lyrics and stuff. And, and later on, he's even, he's even back for this one, right? No more tears. There's a little dispute over the no more tears bass riff. Mike in his writes it. Um, Bob comes in and does the album. Mike comes back, I believe, to do the tour, um, something like that. But anyways, and, and Bob plays it on the album. But Bob, Bob is a big part of this again. And um, and that's kind of the cool thing. And just just this, you know, this battered wives sy syndrome with Bob. He's like, he's out, he's back. He's, you know, they, here, here's some pay, come back, you know, reel him back in. He does it. Um, but it, but it is really odd that, you know, here he is as the bass player, um, just along the way uh, earlier on before Ozzy again, Rainbow, he's, he's part of this. Um, but again, you know, not, not, not a long lived thing. And then I, I love the fact that he's part of this as well. Yeah, I was right? so, going to say, yeah. Yeah. So this is really cool that he's, he's in the band and writing and really, you know, probably helping to transform the band during these years as well. So how does this work? So, yeah. So this is right after, after being kicked out of Ozzy for the yep. first time. Uh, and then Rainbow is uh, is just post Widowmaker, so and then and then it's into Ozzy. But yeah, what a great career! Great guy to talk to. Uh, you know, his, he was active on the scene for a long time. Then he did some kind of super groupy things along the way. This Living Loud album is Bob with uh, with big Australian legend Jimmy Barnes on vocals, Lee Kerslake. So you're getting half the Ozzy band on this, and Steve Morse right um along the way chicken shack mungo jerry early on in the 70s so yeah it goes widow maker rainbow ozzy keep back to ozzy uh uh gary moore victims of the future run for cover um ozzy ultimate sin again gary moore black sabbath the eternal idol but everybody kind of played in that <laughs> those versions of sabbath engve more gary moore mother's army there you go there's your mother's right, army guy, right um so wow talk about a talk about a hired gun but um yeah Ho hoochie coochie man with john lord um bob daisley and friends but yeah it looks like three three-ish mother armies um so yeah you know and so many of these guys end up in gary moore's band too right we could almost do a whole episode how how he's part of this whole thing as well right mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah his uh Definitely his his claim to fame, I, I suppose, would be that short stint with Rainbow, but more so uh, how he's the iconic writer of the lyrics of most of Ozzy's biggest hits. Yeah, yeah. I heard his uh, his autobiography is a blast to read. I, I would love to get a hold of that one of these days. Yeah, big, huge hardcover full of pictures, too. <laughs> amazing, amazing candid shots of working on those albums with Max Norman, you know, yeah. sitting up there, Ridge Farm, I guess it is. But yeah, really, really cool that way uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and a rock solid bass player too. Again, he's another one of those guys that just kind of just fits in there. It's not like he's doing all sorts of crazy stuff, but he's helping write the music and he's, he's there in the pocket with the drummer. And that's, that's what he does. Right. Looks good. He's got that kind of wise Swami, you know, distinguished, distinguished English guy look, even though yeah. he's from Australia, but yeah, he's, he's again, another one of these guys that's just the perfect package up there on stage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, my final pick of the day is uh, to kind of get back to what we were talking about earlier with the whole John Wett thing. You could kind of call this guy a hired gun, not just for his vocals, mainly for his vocals, but also a tremendous bass player, too. I'm talking about Glenn Hughes. Um, you know, again, a guy, and he's probably may even have the biggest resume out of anybody we're talking about today or close to it. But, uh, you know, first kind of comes onto the scene with this band called Trapeze alongside uh, Mel Galley and Dave Holland, all right? Uh, Mel Galley would later wind up in Whitesnake. Dave Holland would wind up in Judas Priest, right? Uh, and for whatever reason, I didn't grab one of the Deep Purple albums. But anyway, after here, very famously, uh, Deep Purple lures him away to join the, what is now known as the Mark III version of the band after Roger Glover and uh, Ian Gillen left. So they bring in Hughes and Coverdale to form one of the great kind of co-vocal teams of all time although you know Coverdale the majority of the vocals but Hughes singing quite a bit and playing a lot of bass obviously uh, they do two studio albums Richie's out do another album with Tommy Boland for the Mark IV and then Deep Purple breaks up uh, during his stint in Deep Purple Glenn develops a you know ridiculous cocaine addiction which uh, would probably take him through the end of the 70s all through the 80s 
and into the 90s. And I think Glenn has now been sober for 30 years, I think, Martin, something like that, just quite a while. Um, but yeah, but, a, a, you know, a period of time where he probably could have died, anybody else would have, but he persevered. But anyway, that's a story for another day. But, uh, you know, he would pop up all over the place. Hughes Thrall, this was this great super group that was, you know, meant to be the next big thing. Of course, you got Pat Thrall, fresh out of uh, Pat Travers band, you got Glenn Hughes, a few years post Deep Purple, did a couple solo albums in between uh, this here. Yeah, when we talked about this a couple weeks ago, you got two guys who have massive problems. This was kind of destined to fail from the beginning, but a really good album. Uh, he did a few albums with this project called Phenomena, which is just like a really good kind of classic rock, kind of like AOR, pop, melodic rock type of thing. Again, with Mel Galley. So he reunited with Mel Galley here and Mel Galley's brother and Cozy's on here and various other people are on here. This very underrated album. Uh, and then there's the Gary Moore thing. So he also hooked up with Gary Moore, which on paper should have been like the greatest thing ever, because I think, you know, Gary was a pretty good singer. But I think Gary having like a tremendous bass player who also could sing lead vocals would kind of free him up to do, you know, concentrate on guitar. And this, you know, they were, that was going to be the new Gary Moore band along with, you know, whoever on drums and, and, and whatnot. But uh, apparently, you know, Glenn was in such sorry shape during the recording sessions that he's, he only appears, I believe, on three songs on here. And then Gary was like, I just can't work with this guy. I mean, he's not fit. He can't do this, right? Uh, the songs he's on are amazing. And just to bring up your point about Gary Moore before, about how he's had so many hired guns. I, I a couple of weeks ago, I was looking up like, um, kind of like past members of Gary Moore's band. And there were times where on certain tours, he would have like a different band for almost every city that he visited. So like there were guys that went in and out of Gary's band, like every couple of weeks. So I think that, you know, another, you know, I love Gary to death. I miss him so much. One of my favorite guitar players of all time, but he's, you know, at times he had kind of like the Ingve thing, right? Just members just coming and going so constant. And sometimes as people, it's hard for, for fans to latch on to certain uh, bands because of that, because there is not that kind of consistent, constant presence. You know, yeah, it's Gary's band for sure. But, uh, but yeah, but this, I, I remember being massively disappointed that this didn't work out because I thought that, uh, that Glenn and Gary were like a perfect match and the songs they did together on here are really, really great. Um, again, he's singing and bass, playing bass there. And then perhaps the most notorious one of all, uh, he gets tabbed to appear on what initially was kind of uh, explained to him to be Tony's, Tony Iommi's solo album. And next thing you know, he's joining uh, Black Sabbath for the new Black Sabbath album. He's going to sing on the entire record. Uh, then they decide to go out on tour. But of course, they're going to have a separate bass player. So Glenn, not used to being on stage without the bass, now he's up there singing just with the microphone. Uh, it's a complete disaster. I think he goes three or four shows before he's kicked off. I saw one of them. He was awful. He had uh, he had vocal problems. He got into a fight with a roadie who punched him in the in the neck, something like that, whatever. He had some kind of thing going on there. But more importantly, this was at the height of his uh, drug and alcohol addiction. So uh, regardless, one of his finest moments, I think. Uh, then, you know, we move into the 90s. By this point, I think Glenn is either sober or on the road to, to sobriety. Uh, he hooks up with John Norm, the guitar player from Europe for this solo album. There's Glenn in the uh, bottom corner there, the big mane of hair. Uh, this is a killer album. He's, uh, he's, again, he's not playing bass on here. We got Peter Baltes from Except on here, but Glenn is singing also one of his strongest vocal performances. They also did a live album together. Uh, what else is in between and all this? Uh, Voodoo Hill, he also, like Graham, played with uh, Dario Molo. Uh, then he forms this, a lot of solo albums, forms this band with uh, Jason Bonham and Joe Bonamassa and Derek Shirini, Black Country Communion. Uh, this is the Afterglow album. They have four in total. Great, great albums. Just good, classic, bluesy, hard rock. Uh, tremendous bass playing. His vocals are still there. Uh, he's now with the Dead Daisies, replacing John Karabi. They're out on tour as we speak. Great, great album here. Holy Ground might be their best album. And again, the guy just singing like a, the complete freak in nature he is. He sounds so good at nearly 70 years old, or maybe he is 70 now. Uh, and tremendous bass playing on here. And the guy has just, he's made a career out of, again, filling in wherever he's needed. 
I think in his mind, he wants to be part of that band that's going to go out year after year and tour and record albums. Maybe this will be it for him. I think he wants to do that with Black Country Communion, but because of Joe's busy schedule, that's not really able to happen. Uh, but I think out of, out of probably all the guys I've talked about, especially the, the, the older guys, he just sounds absolutely incredible still at his age. And he's just uh, such a nice guy and such a true professional. And I think his whole story is uh, really, really interesting considering all he went through that probably he shouldn't even be alive today. But thankfully he is. And, uh, you know, he's a, a devout family man and a big animal advocate. He's got like a whole house full of dogs and cats and just like uh, it seems to be just a genuine beautiful human being and he's given us a, a lot over the years uh, of great music and uh, but yeah but he's still he's he's, he's a he's a higher gun he's a higher yeah gun. yeah well put and and you know as as we talked about with jason newstead and voivod i i think with glenn when you net it all out black country communion is is going to be the greatest thing he's going to be or he should be remembered for because those those albums are masterpieces and it's and it's a band it's a it's a band with lightning in a bottle and all these different personalities just firing off boom 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 yeah. right there's and something really to say about chemistry right and and i yeah. think and i remember specifically when they did you know they did the first album they did a couple tour dates here and there but you know they they really couldn't go out and do a full tour because of joe's schedule and then they pumped out that second album really quickly and i remember like reading all over uh, you know the magazines and the internet where you know glenn was expressing his frustration it's like this is the band this is the band that i always wanted to be in we should be going out there and taking over the world and why can't joe like carve out some time to do this and it caused some friction between the two of them and then you know before you know it they were like okay black country communion is done and, and most of us were like how can this be this is like the greatest band that's come around in decades right this should be a monster band i mean if this was the 70s this would be a monster band yeah. kind of a little different and you know joe has got a ridiculously popular solo career very lucrative so yeah. uh and you know i i wonder too it's like well why don't they just kind of continue on without joe but i think they really to them it's like it's either that lineup or it's no lineup right and so you know they've they've since mended fences and gotten back and pumped out a couple more albums but still uh we haven't seen the big black country communion tour or, you know any kind of commitment that that's going to be more than just a kind of studio project when they have time to do it and maybe now with Glenn and the Dead Daisies, maybe for him, this is this is going to be that band that he can go out with and tour regularly year in and year out, pump out an album a year. And, and you know, we'll see. Great stuff, though. I don't know what your opinions are on this album. I, I think it's probably the best thing they've ever done. Definitely. It, it is great stuff. And I, I hope the lineup stay consistent so they can grow more so as a band because there's not that track record uh, yet with them. But um, right, right. I, I don't I don't really I still feel black country communion has a lot more chemistry and obscurity and eccentricity to it than dead daisies dead daisies is a little is a little sawed off and made a little too perfect uh compared to something like a black country communion i i just think i agree with you i just think they were the greatest band in 20 years of in in that in that whole field of and it all works it all works rock. yeah and i think what i like about it is and i'm a i'm a bonamassa fan but i think that black country communion takes a takes him a little bit out of his normal element although i think he's a big fan of classic rock and blues and hard rock anyway uh but i think it presents him in a different light that we don't normally see and it Glenn's voice perfectly complements his guitars. You, you got to have a guy like Jason just hammering away underneath. And I think, you know, Sherinian adds just what he needs to, you know, he's there on the Hammond organ and occasional synthesizers or whatever. And it just, it just all works. It all works. And you got the two guys who can sing, right? Glenn does the, you know, 80%, 90%. You got Joe singing a couple tunes and one or two on each album. And it, it just, it works. And I think every album is really, really strong and, you know, in a perfect world, everybody who would know who Black Country Communion is. Yeah. But cool. Whatever. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, finishing up our uh, two episode series on those hired guns. So if you think there's any that we have, uh, you know, kind of forgotten, put them in the comments below. It'll be interesting to kind of check those out. And uh, before we go, want to let Martin update us on what's new on his end and uh, shows and books and all that good stuff. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, so I did I did the latest episode of History and Five Songs with Martin Pavlov. That was on the history of post-punk. 
uh, and that was episode 117 or so. Um, we had the Gillen and the Motorhead episode of the Contrarians go up, uh, plus a, a big, huge analysis of Queen Hot Space. And we've got the Motley Crew episode of Contrarians going up in the next couple of days. And other than that, any, any of my books that are available, they're at martinpopoff.com. Cool. Sounds good. Coming up here on the channel, we've got, uh, let's see, it is Friday. Coming up on Sunday, we've got album homework assignment. We've got uh, Rich Catino going up against Jamie Laszlo. That's happening on Sunday. They've each been given their assignments and they're raring to go, getting ready to talk about them. So looking forward to that. Uh, Monday, we've got the Hudson Valley Squares, where we will be uh, taking a look at some of our favorite albums from 1978. Tuesday in the Prague seat, talking about our favorite uh, Prague and Fusion bass players. Uh, Wednesday, new product review day. Thursday, back at the Monsters Den for a look at uh, some of our favorite uh, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing film pair offs. And then uh, Martin will be back next Friday, one week from today. So stay tuned for that. And a lot more here at the channel. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquilly.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time for Martin Popoff, IMP Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you real soon. Bye bye.